Hello, my name is Magnus Peterson, and this video is about long-term forecasting of a house price index. I'm actually not interested in this topic myself, but just to briefly explain why I'm doing this. The first reason is that maybe about five years ago, an old friend of mine asked me about whether it was possible to somehow calculate if the house prices in India were unusually high, because he wanted to buy property in India but for the same money, he could buy something a lot better in Denmark. I didn't know anything about house prices, and especially in India, but I thought about it briefly, and it made sense to me that the house prices ought to have some kind of stable relation to people's earnings or income. If it would take people a 100 years or more to pay back the house price, then it was clearly not stable. And I also suggested that he might look at the historical relation between average house prices and average income. I didn't think much about this for maybe five years, but then recently I saw an interview with a Nobel laureate in finance and economics who has spent his whole life studying long-term returns on stock markets and house prices, and the journalist asked him whether the US housing market was in a bubble again and whether he could predict the future return on house prices. And the professor said that even though he had been working on this his whole life, he didn't know how to do that. And of course, because I am the super genius that I am, <laughs> no joking, please. But in that moment, I realized that the forecasting method I had recently developed for stock markets could probably also be used for house prices. So that is what we're going to do in this video here. So what we have here is the so-called house price index for United States. And we are using a particular data set here, but there are links so that you can try this out with other data sets. But this house price index measures average price changes of single family houses in United States. And when we plot it, it looks like this. And you can see that from 1979 until 2018, it had a fairly regular increase most of the time, but then the increase accelerated and it peaked around 2006 or seven. And then there was a crash with a bottom around year 2012. And then it started increasing again. This is the so-called nominal index, which means that it has not been adjusted for inflation. The so-called real or inflation adjusted index is shown here. And this is basically just the house price index divided by a consumer price index. And you can see that this is more irregular, but it has the same peak here around year 2006 or seven or something like that. And then a crash with the bottom in 2012. But the period between 1979 and 1999 is not as smooth as it was for the nominal house price index. So now let's look at the personal earnings. And again, we're using a particular data set here. And this shows the median weekly earnings of wage and salary workers in the United States. And we can see that this increased fairly steadily as well. And in 1979, it started at $234. And it ended in 2018 at $876. So that is almost a fourfold increase in the weekly earnings for a normal person in the United States. But again, this is the nominal earnings. And this plot here shows the inflation adjusted or real earnings. And this is just calculated by taking the nominal earnings and dividing it by the consumer price index. This is a lot more irregular. And over this 40 year period, it increased only about 5%, which corresponds to about 0.1% in annualized growth. So the median earnings for normal people in the United States grew almost nothing in real or inflation adjusted terms over this 40 year period. We can also look at the one year growth because that is what we're going to use in the forecasting model. So this plot shows the one year growth in nominal earnings. And on average, that was about 3.4% per year. This plot shows the one year growth in real or inflation adjusted earnings. And this is highly irregular from one year to the next, but it looks to be mean reverting with an average growth of about 0.15% per year. This plot shows the mortgage rate so that if you want to borrow money to buy a house, this is the annual interest rate that you have to pay on that loan. And we can see that around year 1980, it peaked at around 18%. That's a lot. And the bottom was here around year 2013, where it was maybe three and a half percent. And I should say that this is for a 30 year mortgage. So this is when you take 30 years to repay the loan on the house. 
This plot shows what I call the mortgage factor, and it is basically the number that you have to multiply with the house price in order to get the full cost of the house when taking all the interest payments into account. And the formula for calculating that is given here, and it is basically just derived from the standard formulas for compounded interest payments. For example, let's say that a house has a cash price of $100,000, and if a 30-year mortgage has a rate of 5%, then the total cost of the house is $195,000. If instead the mortgage rate had been 7%, then the mortgage factor would be about 2.42, so the total cost of the house would be $242,000. It makes sense that the mortgage rate should be taken into account when trying to gauge whether the house price is too high or low and what the future return on that house will be. This plot here shows that there's an almost linear relation between the mortgage rate and the mortgage factor. Okay, so let's move on and talk about valuation ratios. When we did the forecasting for stock returns, we used a valuation ratio which was the price divided by the sales. So it was the share price divided by the sales per share for a given company or for a stock market index. You could also use the price to earnings ratio or the price to book ratio. So these are all examples of valuation ratios. This plot here shows two things. The yellow line is the house price index that we also saw above, and the blue line is the personal income or earnings for a normal person in the United States. These have both been normalized to start at 1, and as we can see, in the 20-year period between 1979 and 1999, these grew almost identically. Then between 1999 and 2006 or 7, the house prices grew far more than the earnings of ordinary people, and we see that as the peak here. This was also known as the subprime mortgage crisis, and it resulted in a very big crash for the US economy. And this is what we have here, where the house price index fell until 2012 and nearly went back to the same level as the personal earnings. After that, the house prices have started to increase more rapidly again, and that is probably why people are starting to talk about a new bubble. So the valuation ratio that we are going to use is the house price index divided by the earnings. So this is kind of similar to the price to earnings ratio for stocks. Here we just have house prices divided by personal earnings. But it makes sense that there should be some kind of stable relation between these two because if the houses become too expensive without people's income growing accordingly, then people simply cannot afford those houses and they will have to find cheaper accommodation. And then you would expect that the market forces of supply and demand over time will pull the house prices back to this equilibrium. So this plot shows the valuation ratio as the house price index divided by the personal earnings. And in the 20-year period between 1979 and 1999, it ranged between 3.7 and 0.41. And then it peaked here in 2006, where it was higher than 0.55. And this was at the peak of the subprime mortgage crisis and just before the crash came. And then the valuation ratio went back down to 0.4 in year 2012, and then it has started increasing again. But in 2018, which is the last data point we have here, it had not yet reached the high level it had here. This plot shows the other valuation ratio that we're going to try, and this takes the mortgage factor into account. So it is the mortgage factor multiplied by the house price index divided by the personal earnings. And as you can see, this is more irregular than for the simpler valuation ratio above. So now let's look at the annualized returns for the house price index. And we have it in this plot here. And the highest level was in 1996 or 1997, something like that, where it was almost 7%. So let's go back up and look at the plot for the house price index. And the way we have calculated this is that we have looked up the level in 1996 which is here, something like 185 or something like that. And then we have moved 10 years forward to 2006. And then we look up the value here, and that is maybe 375. Then we take that value here, divide it by the value from 1996. And then we take that ratio to the power of 1 divided by 10. And from all of this, we subtract 1, and then we get the annualized return. And we do that for all dates here until 2008, 
because our data set ends in 2018, so the last 10 year period starts in 2008. And let's go back down and plot all of those points that we have calculated and it looks like this. So again, the highest was almost 7%, the lowest was about 0%, and I should say that these are the nominal returns. The inflation adjusted or real returns are shown in this plot here, and it has roughly the same tendencies, but now the highest annualized return is only about 4%, but the lowest one is a loss of maybe 1.7% per year. So what we now want to find out is whether the valuation ratio has some kind of relation with the annualized returns. And so we make a scatter plot like this. On the x-axis, we have the valuation ratio. This is the basic one with the house price index divided by the personal earnings. On the y-axis, we have the annualized returns for 10 year periods. So we have basically just taken all the data points from above. So for each date, we have taken the valuation ratio and the annualized return from that start date and going 10 years forward. Then we plot all of the data points and we get this. So the first thing we note is that there is some kind of downward slope. And if you have seen the previous videos on stock market forecasting, you may recognize that this looks similar to the slopes we had there. As the valuation ratio goes up, the annualized returns go down. We also have a large cluster of points over here and the colors of the dots show the mortgage rate. But we are mostly going to ignore those and just focus on the valuation ratio versus the annualized returns. So let's try and make a mathematical forecasting model. And I forgot to say at the beginning of this video that I did actually look up papers with forecasting of the house price index. There's not a lot of papers on that subject and they are all using basically regression based methods to see what is the relation between predictive variables and changes in the house price index. Some papers use slightly more sophisticated machine learning methods or more sophisticated statistical models. But as far as I know, what we're going to do here is completely original. And again, it's using the same idea from the stock forecasting models that we made in previous videos, where we start with the definition of annualized return, which we have here. So we have the house price index at time step T plus a number of years divided by the house price index at an earlier time step T. And we take this ratio to the power of one divided by years, and then we subtract one. And this is just the definition of the annualized return, which was used to calculate that in the plots we saw above. What we want to do is somehow be able to predict the annualized return from the valuation ratio, which was the house price index divided by the personal earnings. And in order to do this, we're going to rewrite the definition of annualized return using a small mathematical trick that some variable x is equal to x multiplied by y divided by y, provided that y is different from zero. It's just a tiny mathematical trick. That means we can rewrite this definition up here by multiplying the top line with this fraction here, the personal earnings for time step t plus years divided by the same. And below the division line here, I can never remember what is the numerator and the DVD data and, you know, crazy words. I can't remember that. So this is the top line and this is the bottom line of the division. And in the bottom line, we do the same trick. House price index T, which we have up here from the definition of annualized return, we multiply it by this fraction, which is basically just one. We multiply it by one, so it's the same. Then we rewrite this, the valuation ratio for the future time step T plus years, multiply it by the growth in personal earnings between time step T and T plus years. And then we take all of this divided by the valuation ratio at time step T. So this formula here is exactly the same as this formula here. It has just been rewritten. So instead of just being defined in terms of how the house price index changes, it is now defined in terms of how the valuation ratio changes from time step T to time step T plus years and how the earnings grow over that period. Now this ratio down here for time step T is known. You should think of this as the current time step. So if you wanted to use this formulas for forecasting the future, this would be the data you would look up today, time step T, whereas the time step T plus years is in the future. And this is of course unknown. So we model this as stochastic variables.
And then we become interested in forecasting the mean of the annualized return and the standard deviation around that mean. And when we take the expectation operator on this formula here, we get this formula down here. So the mean annualized return is some parameter A divided by the valuation ratio at time step T, that is today, to the power of one divided by the years that we want to forecast, minus one. And the parameter A is defined as the mean of this formula here, which is the future valuation ratio multiplied by the growth in personal earnings between time step T and T plus years. And all of this to the power of one divided by years. That is the definition of A. These two formulas here follow directly from the definition of annualized return. This is not a model. This is a fact. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and simplify it a little and make an estimate of what this might be in the future. And then we turn it into a model because, of course, we cannot predict the future. But if you could foresee with complete accuracy the future valuation ratio and the earnings growth between now and 10 years into the future, then you could, of course, say with complete accuracy what the annualized return on the house price index is going to be. But we can't do that, so we're going to use historical data, and this means we're going to make an estimate. So if we assume that the valuation ratio and the earnings growth are independent of each other and over time, then we can estimate the parameter A from the mean valuation ratio multiplied by the mean annual earnings growth. So this is the formula that we are using when we are making the forecasting model. It is also useful to know how imprecise the forecast is. So we also want to calculate the standard deviation of the annualized return. And using the properties of the standard deviation, we get this formula here, where the standard deviation of the annualized return is another parameter B divided by the valuation ratio at time step T to the power of one divided by years. And the parameter B is defined as this formula here, which is the standard deviation of the future valuation ratio multiplied by the growth in earnings between now and the future date, and all of this to the power of one divided by years. In the previous videos on stock market forecasting, I used a Monte Carlo simulation to estimate this number B, because the closed form formula would be very complicated, especially because in the previous video, we had more factors. We had both dividends, we had the valuation ratio, and we had the growth in sales. So we had three factors, not just two as we have here. And we could also use Monte Carlo simulation here, but I decided to try this simple formula instead, which estimates the parameter B from the standard deviation of the annualized valuation ratios multiplied by the annual earnings growth. And this is very simple to calculate. So this forecasting model used the basic valuation ratio, which was the house price index divided by the personal earnings. And when we want to take the mortgage factor into account, we just use that valuation ratio instead in all of these formulas above. So for calculating the mean annualized return, the standard deviation and the parameters A and B. Now, when using the real or inflation adjusted returns instead of the nominal returns on the house price index, we of course use the real returns when we are making the scatter plots that you're going to see in a moment. And we also use the real earnings growth in the formulas for calculating the parameters A and B in the formulas that we just derived but we will still use the normal valuation ratios that have not been adjusted for the inflation. And one way of seeing why we do that is that if you have a ratio like this one here, and you would adjust both the house price index by dividing it by the consumer price index, and you would adjust the personal earnings by dividing that by the consumer price index, then we would basically just have a fraction with the consumer price index here and another one here, and they would cancel out. So there's no difference and it would just be equal to the normal valuation ratio. The forecasting model has been implemented in this Python class here, and I'm not going to go through that now. It is very well documented and it's fairly simple. And we also have a plotting function here, which is also well documented, so you can modify that if you want. So now let's try and use the forecasting model, and we will start with the basic valuation ratio, which is the house price index divided by the personal earnings and we will consider nominal returns on the house price index. So the plot shows several different things. Each dot shows an actual historical data point for a given valuation ratio and a given annualized return. The dashed black line here 
shows the mean annualized return, and we call this for the baseline, which is useful in comparison to how well or poorly the forecasting model fits the data. The solid black line here is the mean forecast, and the green area is one forecasted standard deviation around the forecasted mean, and the red area is two standard deviations. As you can clearly see from this plot, the forecasting model has a horrible fit to one-year returns. And we see that the mean absolute error is 8.4% for the forecasting model, while it is only 2.8% for the baseline. The R-squared value is minus 6.39, and it is negative because this is a nonlinear model, which has a very poor fit. So let's look at two-year annualized returns, and we have that plot here. I suppose you might say that the forecasting model is starting to fit the data points down here, but there seems to be two arcs in the data point. So there's this one here, and then there's this one up here. So once again, we have a negative R squared value because the overall fit is very poor. For four year annualized returns, the two arcs in the data start to get a little closer together. And all of the data points in this cluster up here are also within one standard deviation of the forecasted mean. So the overall R squared is 0.38. It's not a great fit, but it is starting to get better. And here we have it for five year annualized returns. And again, the data points start to get a little closer to the forecasting model with an R squared value of 0.55. And for six year annualized returns, the R squared improves a little more to 0.63. And the plot shows us that the data points get a little tighter around the forecasted mean. The optimal forecasting period appears to be around 8 years, where the R squared value is 0.65, and the plot looks like this. So the forecasting model has definitely captured this downward slope, but we have this cluster of points out here, and the forecasted mean is a little too high on this right hand tail out here. And for 10 year annualized returns, the fit has become slightly worse with an R squared value of 0.62, and the plot looks like this. So now let's try and use the inflation adjusted or the real returns on the house price index. And we will only show this for eight year periods because that had the best fit for nominal returns. And the plot looks like this. So once again, the forecasting model has captured this downward sloping trend in the historical data. But this data is also more dispersed, so now the R squared is only 0.36. So now let's try and use the mortgage factor in the valuation ratio. And remember that the purpose of this was to adjust the house prices to take into account the given level of mortgage rates. And this plot shows us for nominal returns on the house price index for eight year periods. And it does look like the model has sort of captured this downward trend here in the data but we have some outliers in the data like here. And so the R squared value is only 0.2. So now let's try and use the mortgage factor in the valuation ratio with real or inflation adjusted returns instead of nominal returns on the house price index. And that is shown in this plot here. And the plot shows that the data points don't have such a strong downward sloping trend anymore. And therefore the forecasting model doesn't fit the data so well anymore. We have several outliers here and here, and here. And so the R squared is minus 0.61 now. So the forecasting model doesn't work when we use the mortgage factor and inflation adjusted returns on the house price index. So in the plots above, we had used the historical valuation ratios. Now let's try and override that with kind of an equilibrium valuation ratio. So here we have a plot with the historical valuation ratio between the house price index and the personal earnings. And we have already seen this plot above where we noted that between 1979 and 1999, the value was quite stable between 0.37 and 0.41 or something like that. And if we print the statistics, we see that the mean and the median were about 0.39 for this period. So let us try and use this valuation ratio in the forecasting model. And then we get the following plot for eight year annualized returns of the house price index. And these are the nominal returns, so they haven't been adjusted for inflation. And now we see that the tail end here, the dots are now more centered around the mean, but this cluster out here is fitted slightly worse. My guess is that the cluster up here is for the eight year period between 1998 and 2006, where the house prices had abnormal growth. 
I would imagine that explains this outlier up here. Let's also try and plot it for the real or the inflation adjusted returns on the house price index. And we have that here. But when using this mean valuation ratio of 0.39, the forecasted mean seems to be too low now, where before it was actually centered quite well here. Okay, so let us summarize what we have done here. We have studied the relation between the house price index and personal earnings in the United States. And we have developed a mathematical model to forecast the return on the house price index, given the current ratio between the house price index and the median earnings for a wide segment of people. We have fitted this model to historical data for USA, and the model didn't work for shorter periods of only a few years. But starting at five year periods, the model started to fit the historical data quite well, and the optimal period seemed to be around eight years. These are the mathematical formulas for forecasting the mean annualized return and the standard deviation for eight year periods of the house price index, and these are the nominal returns. And to use these formulas, you would simply look up the data for the house price index and the personal earnings, and you would plug in the ratio in the formulas here, and that would give you the mean and standard deviation for the annualized return over the next eight year period. If you believe that the future growth in personal earnings will be different from the past, then you can adjust these numbers A and B using the formulas that we showed above. Or if you believe that the ratio between the house price index and the personal earnings will permanently change in the future, then you can adjust that accordingly as well. And the accuracy of the forecasting model will depend on how accurately you can predict these two numbers, the future valuation ratio and the future earnings growth. It seems reasonable to me to assume that there is some equilibrium between the house prices and personal earnings because people have to pay for the housing along with all other living costs such as food, transportation, healthcare, insurance and so on. So a large divergence between the house prices and personal income should eventually revert to a more stable level. Now we also consider the real or inflation adjusted returns on the house price index and the forecasting model fit the historical data reasonably well, but the fit was significantly better for nominal returns on the house price index. And we also considered a variant of the valuation ratio which took into account the current mortgage rates, but this didn't work so well on historical data. And the reason is perhaps that the house prices may already take the mortgage rates into account somehow. So we might have double counted the mortgage rates if we also incorporate them in the valuation ratio explicitly. If you think this is an interesting topic you might like to work on, I have written a few research ideas here. Good luck.